One thing, if you'll notice on the top of the screen, the huge screen where the words forgive, love, and unite for God's kingdom. And so I went back and I reflected on where those words came from. And those words came from uh, True Father's message to America centered on a crisis of Watergate that took place in the early 1970s, around 1973 and 1974, just as I was joining our movement. And some of you were joining then, some of you were already there. And I wanted to go back and I want to talk about the providence of God and each of us as an individual. And also these words, forgive, love, and unite. And I want to, um, actually I made a copy of uh, the Watergate statement that uh, Father put in the newspapers in, uh, I think it was November 30th. November 30th, 1973. Uh, this was a decision that True Father made, and, and when we read these words, you'll, you'll see his, his heart and his spirit behind this. So let's read this together. Ever since I was 16 years old, now remember this was, this was printed in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Los Angeles, you know, this was printed. We paid lots of money to make this. And there was a picture of True Father, and there was, you know, this message to the American people. So this was made very, very public. Ever since I was 16 years old, I have constantly encountered the presence of God. I have been able to share with the world numerous insights that he has shown me. On January 1st, 1972, God spoke to me again in my prayers. He told me to go to America and speak to the American people about hope and unification. In obedience to God's call, I came and began the Day of Hope tour. In 1972, I took this message to seven American cities. The current nationwide speaking tour began in Carnegie Hall, New York, on October 1st, 1973, and will go to 21 American cities, declaring a message of hope and unification. After New York, I spoke in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, Dallas, Tampa, and Atlanta. The kind welcome I received in these great American cities deeply moved me. I am especially grateful to the mayors and other officials who responded by proclaiming the day of hope and unification in their communities. My travels in America have shown me a troubled land. The moral and spiritual decline is tragic and shocking. Many people are no longer proud to be Americans. The American nation seems mortally wounded in spirit and soul by the tragedy of Watergate. We are witnessing a crisis probably unprecedented in American history. The situation is very serious. First of all, before we go on, how many of you remember Watergate? You know, Watergate, I, I just want to just give a very brief overview. Watergate is actually the name of a hotel in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And during this campaign time between the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, there was a group of uh, Democrats who were, you know, making plans how to carry out their campaign, the political campaign. And for whatever reason, there was a, a small group of Republicans that were connected to the White House that got this idea into their mind that they wanted to find out what they're planning. So they broke in to one of their rooms. They even, you know, they went into one room and they crawled through the, uh, the air, air vent or something like that. You know, they were just really being kind of stupid and they were trying to basically find out, you know, what are they planning? How are they going to run their campaign? And of course, uh, they got caught. 
or it was discovered that they were doing this. This is, in essence, exactly what happened. And then they were accused of, you know, trying to break and enter and, you know, trying to spy on the Democrats. And, of course, President Nixon at this time was a Republican. And these were people that worked under him. So everyone was concerned. Okay, did President Nixon approve this? Was he a part of this? You know, what's going on here? This is, you know, a terrible. And the reason that it became such a big deal is because in the beginning, they denied that they did it, first of all. They, they said, no, we didn't do this. But as the evidence came out, it was true that they did break in. Then the entire question became, how much did the president know about this? Did he approve this activity? And then President Nixon wouldn't admit or agree or, or confess or explain to the American people what was really going on. He was too proud or whatever, and he tried to hide the, the situation and cover it up. And it got blown way out of proportion. But you have to understand that all of this was going on while communism was advancing across the world. And President Nixon understood to a certain degree the seriousness of the problem of communism. So not only were there people that were, you know, like Democrats that were angry at the Republicans for breaking in to try to spy on them, but behind those Democrats were communist sympathizers and people that knew that they could use this situation to attack the president to attack America and to weaken America and its resolve. So if you were there at that time, and I was, Watergate became front page news. It was just talked about endlessly. And it became such a big, serious issue. But in fact, all it was was a group of stupid guys breaking in, trying to find out what kind of strategy the Democrats were going to use in their political campaign, and they got caught. We're not talking about selling secrets to the Soviet Union or murdering or killing them. No. We're talking about a really stupid thing that, that these men did. But the problem compounded and became more and more of a big problem because initially they denied the truth. And they wouldn't confess, and they wouldn't explain, really, to the American people what happened. And so there was he said, she said, whatever. And that, because it became blown out of proportion at one point, Father knew. Father could see what was going on. And so he, he, he stepped in. It is more than a political, social, and economic crisis. It is a crisis of the human soul. This is not only the problem of the man in the White House. It is a crisis for all of us. On November 10th, 1973, I took two weeks out of my tour and returned to Korea. I used that time for prayer and meditation in a desperate search for an answer and new hope for America. Today we hear so much about America's troubles. What is wrong and who is to blame? What should be done and what cannot be done? Vicious accusation is becoming a daily staple in the American diet. Hatred and bitterness are killing the human soul. Some people cry out, impeach the president. Opinion is divided, and the people talk on. Should the president remain in office? Should the president resign or be tried? We were all witnesses to America's assassination of her president, John F. Kennedy, in 1963. But today, without many realizing it, America is in the process of slowly killing her president once again. A bullet killed Kennedy, yet the nation united in a common feeling of sorrow and repentance. This time, the bullet of hatred and accusation is capable of destroying not only the president, but the nation with him. In a war of hatred, no one is the winner. All thinking American people feel grave concern for the future of their country. Some even believe America has been struck a fatal blow. However, at this critical moment in American history, 
it is disappointing and strange that no one is asking, what is the will of God? If America was conceived as one nation under God, then the answer must come from him. Have we stopped asking? I bend my head and place my ear upon the heartbeat of America. I hear no one seeking the solution from above. We keep on criticizing and the nation sinks. We criticize some more and the nation falls even further, deep into great peril. Now is the time for America to renew the faith expressed in her motto, in God we trust. This is the founding spirit that makes America great and unique. God blessed America because of this spirit. Furthermore, America is fulfilling a vital role in God's plan for the modern world. God is depending on America today. Therefore, the crisis for America is a crisis for God. An answer must come from above, from God, from the one who has the answer. I have prayed to God earnestly, asking him to reveal his message. The answer came. The first word God spoke was, forgive. America must forgive. Whatever wrongs have been done, whatever mistakes are being made, America has a noble deed to perform. America must forgive. The Watergate affair is an error. Not only the error of a few men, but the error of humanity the era of the American people. The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. If we want God to forgive us, we have to forgive each other first. The Watergate is not merely a test of the president. The Watergate is a test of America's faith. How will this nation stand before God in the midst of moral crisis? Can this nation, which was founded 200 years ago based on Christian tradition, uphold that same tradition today? Can this nation prove its generosity and mutual forgiveness? Can it love? This is the test for the American people. Long ago, the American settlers on the New England shores made many grave mistakes. But with their trust in God, they came through many crises. They could then lead America to prosperity. The Bible speaks of the time the scribes and the Pharisees tested Jesus. They brought him to a woman to be stoned. She had been caught in the act of adultery. Mosaic law demanded retributive to justice, but Jesus' message was forgiveness. He stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the eldest, and Jesus was left all alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked at and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. Nobody dared to cast the first stone. Who among you will be the one to cast the first stone? This is no time to cast stones upon your leader. This is no time to cast stones upon one another. I have been praying specifically for President Richard Nixon. I asked God, what shall we do with the person of Richard Nixon? The answer did come again. The second word God spoke to me was love. It is your duty to love him. We must love Richard Nixon. Jesus Christ loved even his enemies. Must you not love your president? What do you do when a member of your family is in trouble? Do you criticize him and tear him apart? Of course not. You guide him. You comfort him. You love him unconditionally. You belong to the American family, and Richard Nixon is your brother. Will you not then love your brother? You must love the President of the United States. This nation is God's nation. The office of the President of the United States is therefore sacred. God inspired a man and then confirmed him as president through the will of the people. He lays his hands on the word of God and is sworn into office. At this time in history, God has chosen Richard Nixon to be the president of the United States of America. Therefore, God has the power and the authority to dismiss him. Our duty, and this alone, is that we deeply seek 
God's guidance in this matter and support the office itself. If God decides to dismiss this choice of his, let us have faith that he will speak. Be very clear. You know, Father is not saying, you know, Nixon is righteous and good and he's without fault or nothing like that. He's making it very clear that the principles of love and forgiveness and especially the position of the presidency at this special time in history is very serious and very important. I continued in prayer, and the third and last word God spoke to me was unite. America must unite. Let us unite in the spirit of forgiveness. Unite in the spirit of love. Now is the time for national repentance. Love is the power to unite. America once knew how to come together to create a powerful nation for goodness upon the face of the earth. America is a beautiful land to behold, a nation of all nationalities, all races, and all religions united together into one working whole. The source of power has been love and faith in God and in one another. The crisis in America today can be overcome. We must rekindle our faith in God and reunite ourselves in love. America's destiny is inseparable from the destiny of the world. America's well-being affects the plans of God, the plan of God. God chose this nation as his champion in his modern day dispensation. With the bicentennial celebration a few years away, God is testing America through the Watergate problem. America must demonstrate unity in love and forgiveness. Let us renew our faith in God for this has been the wellspring of America's power. America must live the will of God. She has no alternative. Who am I to say this to the American people? I am not even a citizen of the United States. I am a Korean, a guest. However, I do this because I love America as much as my own country. This is a country God loves, and I love God, and he is our Father in heaven. Wherever God my Father dwells, there is my country. Indeed, the Father's country is also the Son's. America belongs to those who love it most. I am as concerned for America's well-being as for my own. This is the foundation of my courage to speak out on this issue. Furthermore, I waited. I waited long. I anticipated that some great American spiritual leader or evangelist would rally America around God above the Watergate at this stormy and depressing time. However, there has been no American spiritual leader speaking out for this unity. I heard no articulate voice in the wilderness crying this to Americans. By this time, God spoke to me again. Fear not. Remember Jonah in Nineveh. Speak out. And I obeyed. And this is why I am doing this. As founder of the Unification Church International, I have declared the next 40 days, starting December 1st, 1973, as a period of prayer and fasting by our members all over the world. In this, we are determined to awaken our nation to this national emergency. America must unite in her Christian tradition of love and forgiveness in the face of this grave crisis created by the Watergate. We hereby launch this national prayer and fast for the Watergate crisis as the only way to heal and unite this nation. This is indeed the day of a dismay and moral crisis. Yet, this is also a great opportunity for America, an opportunity in which the American people can demonstrate America's true greatness in faith and courage. Historically, great peoples have proved their greatness not during normal situations, but in crisis. This is the time the American people must act as a great people who put trust in God. Then this day will he a day, then this day will be a day of new hope and unification. In God we trust. In these four words lie America's key to survival and prosperity. America must live the will of God. And God's command at this crossroads 
in American history is forgive, love, and unite. Father went on and we actually uh, carried out many activities. I, after I joined, I was participated trying to uh, help America have the right attitude, not only toward Nixon and toward the presidency or toward you know, America herself, but also understanding the nature of communism and how at this time, remember, the Vietnam War was raging and this was a very a difficult and challenging time. And uh, Father knew that if America withdraws from Vietnam, then many, many people are going to die. Millions of people are going to die as a result because as communism would advance. And unfortunately, this is what happened. Dr. Park and Father and President Nixon and one other man were the only four people in the room when Father entered the room and met with President Nixon. And Dr. Park explained in his book, he gave testimony about what happened. Because of this Watergate message, and because our members were so aggressive to, uh, to do these things, will you pray with us? This was one of the, the pamphlets. And we uh, members, this is even before I joined. And then uh, Father even had us do a very special thing. Do you remember this? Three days of praying and fasting on the steps of the Capitol building. And uh, we were there. See these posters? Everybody that was there had the poster of a particular senator or congressman and the information about them. I was wearing a poster board like this for some senator or congressman from North Carolina. To be honest with you, I, I almost remember none of it. And we, we fasted and prayed for three days and nights. We didn't leave the Capitol steps. We sat there all night long and slept there. And we didn't eat for three days and three nights, the whole army of us. And during the day, we would march around Washington and we would pray and we would sing our you know, wonderful songs led by, you know, people like Dan Pfefferman. And then, at different times, the congressmen and the senators would come. And they would come to meet the person that was praying for them. And again, I'm sorry, I don't remember a lot, but I do remember the congressman or the senator that I represented came. Very briefly, he came and shook my hand and you know, I said, I'm praying for you, you know. I, I was, this was, you know, I was just a member for a couple of months at that time. And President Salonen was wearing the poster for Nixon. And of course, you know, in our, you know, the hierarchy of our church had, you know, the, there, were, there was the Secretary of State, the Secretary, you know, the people were wearing all the different posters. So the, the, the goal, the ambition, the, the hope was that President Nixon himself would come. But he didn't come. But he finally wrote a letter. And he sent his main representative. And the main representative came with the letter. And I'll, ne I'll never forget, we were sitting on the steps, and this representative came with the letter. And he was, he was reading from the letter, you know, it was President Nixon, thank you so much. Your support really moves me, you know. He knew what was going on. And then, just as, as uh, the representative turned and handed the letter to President Salonen, car drove up with Father in it. And it was like Father drove up in this car and the car was moving very slowly. And it's like Father just reached his hand out and took the letter. <laughs> and he looked at all of us and he waved like this and he just kind of drove away smiling, you know. It was just very interesting. And, but it was all providential. You know, Father knew providentially what was going on. So, when Father walked into the office, was President Nixon. The first thing he did, you know, President Nixon was there, he was very polite and cordial. He said, oh, Reverend Moon, thank you very much. You know, you've, you've been you know, praying for me and supporting me, I really appreciate that. And then Father just grabbed his hand and started praying. And he prayed in Korean, and Dr. Park said he didn't translate the prayer. 
because he just wanted Father's spirit to come through. So Father prayed at a, an unreasonably long time, just stood there holding Nixon's hand, praying in Korean like this. You know, you, I mean, you can imagine one minute of prayer, you know, under circumstances like this is a long time. This was probably four or five or six minutes of Father just praying in Korean. Then Father released him, and Nixon said again, oh, thank you very much. And then Father just spoke to him very strongly and clearly and said, you know, you're a very important person. You know, you have to be very clear. You know, I pray, I pray for you. You, you have to really uh, be, res be responsible. Said, and Father just told him very clearly, you have to get, you have to go publicly. And you have to stand in front of everyone. Tell the American people you're sorry. You have to repent and apologize that you were, you know, weren't honest and clear and just be right up front with the American people and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, this was really uh, a mistake, this shouldn't have happened, uh, this is how much I had to do with it, and this is how much I didn't have to do with it, and put it in the hands of the American people and be sincere and honest. And if you really repent, and he, Father told him, you have to repent with tears. And Father gave him, and, and Nixon, according to, this again, according to Dr. Park's testimony, and I, I trust his testimony, Dr. Park knows English very well, he said President Nixon didn't say, yes, I will do this, but he said, yes, you know, Reverend Moon, you're right, I, I have to really consider this, I have to really consider what you're saying. And Father was very adamant and sincere and said, if you do this, you know, the American people will forgive you. And, you know, and, you know, this is important. You have to, you know, take responsibility for this. So Father gave him this very clear advice. And, he, and then he said, you, you know, I, I read your history. And President Lincoln, at the time of the war, the Civil War, after the Civil War, President Lincoln uh, declared a, a national day of prayer for the healing of the nation. He said, you need to declare a day of the, to pray and the healing of the nation. So Father told him, not only you repent, but you declare a, a day of prayer. And this is the very strong and very clear advice that Father gave Nixon. And then, you know, Father left. And our movement continued. And that's when we continued to do all of these things, you know, and to carry on. And uh, Father was very uh, adamant about this and supported. But history is the record. Oh, you can see. You can see all kinds of people in there. I'm wondering, is that well born? Doesn't it look like him? Oh, I'm sorry. No. See anybody you recognize? President Sloan. Anyway, President Nixon never came in front of the American people and really confessed or admitted, apologized. He didn't declare a day of prayer. He didn't. He didn't bring God into the situation. Instead, he, he was too proud, whatever the situation was. He stonewalled, and he maybe felt eventually it would go away, and it didn't go away. And then finally, uh, he resigned, first president to resign. And after he resigned, and, and Gerald Ford became the president, then the whole situation concerning Vietnam and, you know, America's position in the rest of the world deteriorated. And uh, Soviet communism advanced aggressively through Cuban proxy forces, and Vietnam fell. And Vietnam, you know, uh, and Cambodia and Laos uh, in the hands of Pol Pot, just terrible. Millions of people died. Millions of people, innocent people died after the war. You know, remember anti-war protesters, oh, you know, you're killing so many people, America's murdering the innocent, you know, uh, but then after the war. Okay, if the war's over, nobody should die, right? But that's not what happened. After the war, millions of people were forced into the jungles and onto the farms and 
the people that spoke English were killed, and it was a terrible tragedy called the Killing Fields. And communism advanced throughout through Africa and through Central America, and liberation theology, and you know Zimbabwe, Mozambique, you know, and the Cuban, all these things happened. Then you know. Father was very aggressive. We became very aggressive to stand up against communism. But the result of Nixon not doing that, Father was pulled down with him. Everybody started saying, well, Reverend Moon is just some right-wing fanatic. He's just, he's a Nixon lover. And you know, he, he's just, uh, you know, he's just supporting Nixon and you know, he's a radical like Nixon. So, Father, by standing up and, and being honest and, and openly supporting the position of the presidency, because Nixon felt that our movement was dragged down with it. And after that, if you look at the history of the American movement, you'll see after that is like so much of the negativity. So many liberal people and, you know, people that were you know, angry and resentful toward Nixon, pushed it on true parents. And of course, Father's standing strong against communism. Anybody that supported communism, any students, leftist students, they were absolutely against Father. And Christians. Christians were very both. They were, they were jealous because they didn't stand up and, and proclaim that we should pray to God and we should forgive. So they felt almost like uh, embarrassed or ashamed by Reverend Moon. But at the same time, you know, as Father begins teaching the divine principle and revealing the very deep truth about God, they twisted that too. Started accusing our movement of, and then brainwashing and all these things. And it, it created a, a difficult situation. But, Father's message, forgive, love, unite, <coughs> Very clear, very pure. I want to read just a few words from Father's speech in 1973. This is about heart. And the, <clears throat> the reason why unity, you know, it's not just forgive and love, but unite. The word unite for, for true parents is so important. In fact, Father even says it's, it's more central, more important to unite. You can't have love if you don't have unity. So here, Father says, if you witness to people and you fail to convince them, it's not because God is not present, it's not because the people are evil, but it is because of yourself being without love. Then you must become a person capable of bringing unity. If you are united with someone, there will automatically come love, like air flowing into a vacuum. If your mind and body are really one, you feel God's love there, like an electric current. Then you forget about fatigue, forget about hardship. You can experiment with living like that, and it will prove true. When you want to speak to the congregation, you want to have God speak through you. You must have your mind and body unified, or God cannot be with you. And before speaking to the people, you must repent if your mind and body are separate. Pray before God in repentance, shedding tears, and in deep prayer you must beg God's forgiveness, and then you can start talking. In that case, you can be the spokesman of God. God may speak through you. The first step is for your mind to become one with God, and then your body will become one with your mind. In that case, God can work through you. Go on and try it, and it will prove true to you. So you must have unity first, because without unity there is no love. Unity first, love, and then God's ideal. You must think with God, say things with God, and plan things with God. The base of those three elements, unity, love, ideal, is heart. Heart is the deeper expression of the mind. Starting from heart, unity, love, and ideal are all realized. We are told that everything starts from God. The core of oneself being heart. Everything starts from there. So
centered on God. Since our heart is the core, then God is the object of us. We seek Him. But in relationship to God's love, our heart is in the object position, receiving His love. When heart and God are put together, they love each other. We must know that the basic thing is our heart, our infinite heart. Creation came about from God's heart, a heart of love. When those three are realized, unity, love, and the ideal, there is no distinction between the three. Unity is love. Love is unity. The ideal is unity. The ideal is love. Then why are those three ultimately one? Unity came about on the horizontal level first. Two elements are one, and then God's love can dwell there. In this way, we have a vertical relationship also. Love will be the director of the three. Then the ideal can be fulfilled. To repeat this, there must be unity on the horizontal level between the two. Then God can become one with that unit. You can have both a horizontal relationship and a vertical relationship, and those three will be put together with perfect love. They will be in ideal harmony throughout all eternity. When you dance around and enjoy together, you don't make a distinction between your place and your partner's position. There is no distinction between you. You can stand in his position, and he can stand in your position. There is unity, love, and your ideal. But knowing this alone cannot do anything. If you really understand, put it into practice. When you say about anything, this is mine, you must love that thing and must be able to realize your ideal through it. If those three are accomplished in you, you cannot be anything else other than a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Is that clear to you? You must always be thinking of unity, unity, unity. When you see, see unity, eat unity, smell unity, hear unity. Everything must be unity first, and then love and harmony, and then the ideal. So in the beginning I said the, the providence of God and the individual, and the, the kind of point that I begin to think and feel is Everything is coming back now to mind and body unity, centered on the love of God and the truth of God. What is our goal, our mission, our hope? We want to live in the kingdom of heaven. We want to create the kingdom of heaven. We want to have the world become the kingdom of heaven. But how will it become the kingdom of heaven? Only if we love as God loves. As true parents have loved us, we must love each other. So the providence, the providential mission of the Messiah, you know, to, to bring God's love and truth from the individual to the, to the family, to the tribe, to the nation, to the race, to the world, to the spiritual world. That's all been done already. Now, everything has gone full circle. And now it comes back to us, each one of us. True parents planted the seed of love and unity and you know, true life, true love, true lineage. Already, it's in us. We are it. We are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Maybe we still, you know, make mistakes. Then we can forgive each other. You know, we're still not perfect. You know, we, we can still do stupid things. You know, people are going to do stupid things. And people don't get along with each other necessarily. Uh, personalities clash. People have their own idea of what's the best way to do something. There's nothing evil about that inherently. But if we try to forcefully or wrongly or you know, through, through, through deceit or through lying 
or through tricking someone, trying to get them to do things. Even if we're trying to get them to do the right thing, that's wrong. That's wrong. We have to be honest. We have to be transparent. We have to be open. True Father, in this message, the Watergate, you know, he put his heart out there. He, he put our movement out there. He put us out there and said, this is what God would want America to do. This is what God wants the people of America. God loves America, and if America will forgive, love, and unite, God will bless this nation. But America didn't. And instead, America rejected true parents. But we persevered. We went on. God's providence continued and advanced, and now it has been fulfilled, completed, totally. So even now, I, uh, the true mothers had the words up there, forgive, love, unite for God's kingdom. The same principle today. Doesn't matter who the president is. Doesn't matter these big situations that are going on. Because each of us has the capacity to influence the people around us in a heavenly way. If you make unity, unity first, then comes love, then the ideal. So any kind of unity is good. Playing games with someone, you know, understanding something about their hobby, or, you know, you just happen to find yourselves going to the same movie together, or last night, uh, Sharon took went and sat outside at a Josh Grogan concert with six, 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 uh, six sisters went. They couldn't pay. You know how much it would cost to go in and see Josh Grogan? It's $50 a person. The cheapest seats, the expensive ones, were $78. So they got it, they got it for free, but they didn't actually see him. They just heard him. <laughs> they were sitting outside. But the point was, there's unity, and uh, and Takai brought a guest, right? Takai brought the Asia. Yeah, a young lady. She, she's getting married. She just recently moved. And anyway, God works if we make unity, and once unity is there, God's love is going to come. People are going to know. They're going to realize there's something about us. So, you know, like Marianne's gone to, to, to go to the university now in, in Boone, and the arena is there. You know, they will affect that whole area. Just their presence there can have an effect on the whole area. We don't know. God works in amazing ways. You know, after the Holy Ground tour, I said to myself, I really should go to the Holy Ground and pray. But I didn't do it. Well, I got this phone call from this woman, and she kept telling me she's trying to buy some wood roses, because every time I sell my wood roses, I leave a little card. And so she was talking to me, and she said she has a friend in Coates or something like that. You know, Coates is a little town. And finally, I said to her, I said, look, where do you work? Uh, you know, I, I can probably come to, to where you work. She said, hey, I work in Raleigh. And she says to me, well, have you ever heard of Dorothea Dix? I said, hmm, yeah, I, I know the place. She says, yeah, I'm working right here in one of the buildings, uh, Dorothea Dix. Uh, can you, I said, how about Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock? So I drive with my wood roses right, right next to the holy ground. I drive up to, the, up, up, you know, to the building and go to the back of the building and she and her friend come out, you know, and I open my trunk and she's looking and they buy some wood roses and, you know, and then I close my trunk and I drive right down and I stop and I go right to the holy ground. I mean, God brought me right to the holy ground Wednesday morning. I, I thought, who, who can do that? Well, only God can do that. You know, so he, he, he Put me right there, and then I and it was a beautiful day, and I had a really nice prayer, praying at the holy ground. But little things like that, 
Little things like that. God is capable of doing incredible things. We, we have no idea what God is really capable of. But God is not, you know, he's not aggressive and he's not, you know, he's not a bully. He's not a forceful type of parent. He's very, very, you know, nurturing and very subtle. God is very, extremely subtle. So he's never going to force people to come to the kingdom of heaven, but he's going to work through true love, through any kind of unity. So this was unity, centered on, you know, she wanted some wood roses, and right there, there I am, right there at Dorothea Dix, right there at the Holy Ground, Wednesday morning. And I was able to spend time praying there. So all of us, every one of us here, God works in this way. Really, sometimes just amazing little things happen. But don't doubt. Don't doubt for a minute that God, that it's not God. You know, sometimes we, we say, oh, the, the spiritual world or the angels. But ultimately, ultimately, it's God himself or herself or his, himself. It's, 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 it's the spirit of God. God is the being who is everywhere. Angels aren't everywhere. Even Father in the spiritual world, he has a specific spiritual self. So, you know, Father probably can move very quickly from one place to the other, but he is still himself. He has a finite form of a spiritual self. He has his own unique character and personality. He is true father, and he's there in the spiritual world doing things. But God is not limited. God is not limited. God is with us every moment. And God knows everything about everything. I mean, he knows everything about everything. That's why things can happen so quickly, and he can you know, maneuver situations so smoothly so that things work out so perfectly, ultimately. And even when things look like they're not working out, that is the moment that God is really expecting us to grow our hearts and to not let go of Him, not forget Him, not you know, reject him or become angry or resentful toward him because things aren't like we want them to be. That's our challenge, to, 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 to get through that cover, that spiritual cover that prevents us from absolutely trusting God and knowing that God is our eternal parent and that everything, everything is good. You know that phrase, it's all good. Believe me, at this time, it's all good. As long as we remain confident and faithful and we make unity and have love and support each other and encourage each other, it's all good. And we have great power. So let us not forget this. So please, uh, if, you, if you get a chance, uh, you know, there's a, I want to show you this. Okay, now you look at this. And notice everything is in blue, right? Sun, Young, Moon's sermons and talks. This is just tparents.org. So if you go to this website, you click on, say, Sun, Young, Moon, sermons and talks. Every one of these is a year. You can go to any year. Let's click on 1976. Boom. All of these are complete speeches. Well, some of them make excerpts, but the, usually the complete speech. You take here, God's Hope for America, or Perfection and Gratitude. You click that. You have pages and pages. I mean, the amount of information that is out there 
you know, true father's words. And, you know, each year, if, if you think about each year in American history, you go there and look at the topics and what true father was saying and teaching. So, such a, a rich and deep content. So we are without excuse concerning uh, father's words and father's message. And in the future, we don't have to worry about the idea that someone's going to come up and, you know, like people, there's 300 different denominations of Christianity, right? Because, you know, there's one very short, small Bible, the New Testament, but who knows, you know, who wrote it and how it was written, etc., etc., etc. So there's a lot of different debate and argument. But if we look at True Parent's words, his public speeches, especially his public speeches and the speeches that he gave to us, then the basic fundamental message is there. It can't be twisted or distorted. The fundamental message of true love, of loving God above everything else, of sacrificing yourself for the sake of others, of making unity with other people, of, of serving others and helping others and supporting others, respecting others, appreciating others, valuing each person. Each person has equal value. The divine principle teaches each person is equal. It doesn't matter if they were born 500 years ago it doesn't matter if they were born, you know, 200 years ago in some remote country in South America and they only lived for four or five months and then they died and went to the spiritual world. That person is as much the son or daughter of God as true father or true mother in the bigger scheme of things. What true parents did was to, be, was to defeat Satan and to create a lineage where all of us can enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what they did. That's why we love them and we respect them and we honor them and appreciate them. But ultimately, in the spiritual world, they are just like us. Father is his own very unique particular kind of God, and mother is her own unique particular kind of person, and they are blessed to each other, and they are the eternal true parents. They're the first ones, but all of us are coming behind them and with them. So that is the incredible teaching of the divine principle. So if anyone is standing up and, and trying to say something different, then they're not teaching what true parents are teaching. You know, and the spirit is clear. The message is clear. You know, who is the true able? Father always said the true able is the person who really loves and serves and tries to help everybody to, you know, to reach their full potential. Who honors people and respects people. But any organization, any group, any movement, any religion that is trying to divide people, that is saying, we're a little bit better than you, or we're a little bit smarter than you, or, you know, that kind of division is counterproductive. True unity, true unification. That's what true parents taught us. That's what true parents are living. And if it's, if it's not manifested around us, it's not because of true parents. It's not true parents' fault. It's our own limitation. It's our own inability to grow our hearts to that point. Forgive, love, unite. The message is exactly the same. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, and always. Okay, let's pray. Say a prayer and then we'll pray in unison. Heavenly Parent, I know the 
these words from true parents are really the truth that we really are meant to really forgive, love, unite, embrace each other, support each other, help each other, encourage each other. That we're all in this together. We're all bozos on this bus. We're all the same, ultimately. We have the same ultimate goals and ambitions and desires. We want to experience true love and we want to we want to be loved and we want to be able to love others. We want to be free to express ourselves and to become and reach whatever our potential is. Help us to grow up and create the environment that allows all of us to prosper. And to, and to find joy and happiness, true joy and true happiness. Thank you for your blessings upon this day. Please be with each and every uh, blessed member here and all people around the world through connecting to our members, through connecting to us. They connect through us to true parents. And the blessing from true parents is now going to the entire world. Your ability to forgive, love, and unite is being manifested in every single nation, in every part of the world. Thank you. We offer our prayers to you and report these things together. In our names, as blessed central families, aren't you?